on the side. Okay. We're good to go. Cool. And you can start sharing your screen as, as well. Sweet, one second. <laughs> okay, cool. Let's get started then. All right. So, um, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out tonight and joining me on a quick, kind of like one hour crash workshop on the most popular fungi that we know mushrooms. Uh, my passion for fungi started about a year ago, and it's been a really awesome journey. And every day, I'm more and more fascinated by what I discover. Uh, mycology as a field, the study of mushrooms, is so new, and there's still so much to tap into that has not even been done yet. So tonight, I'll go over the basics of what a mushroom is, and also share some cool Ontario mushrooms, some foraging chips, and how to make a spore print. So. Uh, during, feel free to place any questions in the chat. Um, I'll get to them at any time during the presentation. And then at the end, we can do some sharing, some Q&A, or you know, whatever we're feeling. <laughs> um, and before I get started, I also want to do a land acknowledgement from the land that these mushrooms come from. Um, I want to acknowledge that the sacred land in which we operate is situated upon the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee, the Ashabe, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee allied nations to peacefully share and care for the lands around the Great Lakes. Black Creek Community Farm recognizes that the many nations of indigenous people who presently live on this land, those who have spent time here and the ancestors who have hunted and gathered on this land known as Turtle Island. And you can go to the next slide now. Um, so to begin, um, a general rule of thumb that is good to know is that all mushrooms are fungi, but not all fungi are mushrooms. So fungi as itself is a group of organisms that are classified in their very own kingdom, meaning that they are not animals, they're not quite plants or, or bacteria. Fungi has a complex system of eukaryotic cells like both plants and animals, and there are about 144 thousand species of organism, organisms in the kingdom of fungi, which includes yeast, it includes rust, mildew, molds, lichen, and mushrooms, and um, possibly millions and millions of other that we just probably haven't even discovered yet. Um, and they also covered the entirety of the globe, even in the Arctic. So there's quite a lot of cover, a lot of ground that mushrooms and fungi as a kingdom cover. Um, and I think some myths about mushrooms are that, oh, they're all poisonous, you touch them, they'll kill you. Um, there's, you know, they're just, you know, little things that pop up or they're weeds, they're a nuisance in the garden, but, you know, mushrooms are really magical. I think that uh, they deserve a lot of attention. <laughs> so now I want to talk a little bit about mycelium, which is the foundation of these mushrooms. So if you look under any log lying on the ground in a forest, you're going to see this fuzzy kind of cobweb like growth and that is called mycelium. So it is a fine web of cells which in one phase of its life cycle will fruit a mushroom as you can see in these images here. Um, this fine web of cells courses through virtually all habitats. It unlocks the nutrient sources that are stored in plants and other organisms. It also builds soils that create basically all the food that we consume today. Um, the mycelium also helps heal and steer ecosystems by cycling nutrients through the food chain. So with every step that you take on a lawn, a field, a forest floor, you're basically walking on these cellular membranes, almost as if you're letting the earth know that, hey, like I'm here. <laughs> so with every step you take, you impact 300 miles or more of mycelium. They channel nutrients from great distances to form fast growing mushrooms and are constantly, constantly on the move, very similar to you know, how our brains work. <laughs> so 
Mycelium is basically, like I, I kind of say, it's like an exposed sentient membrane. It's aware and responsive to changes in the environment. And as hikers, animals, insects, or anything living on this earth walk across them, they leave impressions on the mycelia sense, and, and then they respond to these movements, which is a really amazing, similar to how when we have a thought, the neurons like fly off in our brain, kind of creating you know, a network in our head. So the mycelium is similar to like the neural network of the earth, which I think is really fascinating. Um, so also whenever there's a big, big environmental catastrophe and a field of debris is created, so it can be a down tree or an oil spill, fungi will respond with waves of mycelium. And this adaptive ability reflects the diversity of fungi and the evolution of the whole kingdom, populated between one and two million known species and 10% of the fungi that we know now are called mushrooms. And actually only about 10% of the mushroom species on earth have actually been identified and like, you know, written down and stuff. So maybe everyone that's in this call right now one day will discover their own mushroom. And I think that'd be really cool to have everyone have a mushroom named after them. Um, and before I move on to talk solely about mushrooms, um, it's important to note that all habitats depend directly on mycelium. The mycelial networks hold soil together and aerates them. Um, fungal enzymes, acids, and antibiotics dramatically affect the condition and the structure of soils. And the soil, of course, as you know, is the foundation of all life. Um, you can go on to the next slide now. So now that we know that mushrooms are the direct fruiting body of the mycelium, and most of us has probably noticed or consumed them during their fruiting body stage, there's still quite a bit of steps uh, occur before the actual fruit, the mushroom, appears. So firstly, mushrooms reproduce through microscopic spores, visible as dust when they all gather together like in one space. Um, and when moisture, temperature, and the nutrients are just right, the spores uh, are free from the mushrooms. So they're basically act like the seeds of the mushrooms. And they germinate into threads of cells that we call hyphae um, from compatible spores to create a mycelial mat. Um, so when that then matures, it gathers all the nutrients and moisture. And then once the mycelium is created in ideal environments, this process should only take a couple of days. Um, a hyphal knot is created and then the pinheads or baby mushrooms are then created. And then you have the big mature fruiting body, which is our lovely mushroom. I can go on to the next slide. So I wanna talk about the class of mushrooms called Basio de Mycota. Um, so we have basically the fundamentals down, you know, like breeze over it really quickly, but it's important. And this is the more fun stuff. <laughs> so basio mycota fungi, gill fungi, and some edible mushrooms are the ones that are common in Ontario. And I just want to talk about them for the rest of this time. And also highlight some of my favorites from each class, some important characteristics. And but honestly, each type of mushroom, everything I want to talk about today deserves a whole book associated with it. So if anything really catches your eye, I recommend maybe writing it down and then diving deeper into the type of mushroom or like mycelium because there's just so much information on everything. <laughs> so basio mycota or club fungi is known for its production of really large fruiting bodies. They include pop balls, jelly fungi, coral fungi, bracket fungi, and bolets. And they are really important agents of wood decay, organic matter decay, leaf litter, and overall playing an important role in the carbon cycle. Um, they are the most evolutionary advanced fungi with a unique life cycle that produces spores that are forcibly discharged both sexually and asexually. So this means that instead of being created by two parent spores sexually, they're actually created only by one and are gen genetically identical to that parent. So it's created asexually. Um, they're also unicellular or multicellular, they're terrestrial or aquatic, and there's about 31,000 known species from this specific class or more. We're still, still searching. Um, you can go on to the next slide. So next we have pop balls. Pop balls falls under the class of basio mycota. 
Um, I don't know how many of you have actually seen pop balls. If you have, just drop a note in the chat. Um, but so pop balls are spherical, subspherical, ellipsoid, or pear shaped. And the outer wall of this fungi is usually roughened with spines that flake off to reveal a smooth, membranous inner wall. The spores mature inside the mushroom as a powdery moss. So when you cut these puff balls, you'll see it has this really like soft, kind of delicate um, cotton-like texture. Um, on the left, we have the pear-shaped puff ball. So this is the most common puff ball that fruits in dense clusters on rotting logs or stumps. And they're edible, but they don't really taste like anything. So <laughs> I would recommend eating those unless you like that. Um, and to the left, or sorry, to the right, we have giant puff balls. So they can go very quite large to about 50 centimeters or more across. And the outside is smooth and white when young. And as it ages, it turns more tan or cinnamon. And it really breaks away to expose the spore mass. And they fruit the best in really rich soil, woods, gardens, or on the banks of streams. And are, they're also edible. Yeah, and you can go on to the next slide. So next we have jelly fungi. So jelly fungi, just like the name is, it's a more gelatinous form. Um, and in dry weather, the fruiting bodies actually lose a lot of water and they form irregular horny masses that shrivel up and disappear. But when the rain comes back, the gelatin absorbs the water rapidly and the fruiting bodies recover their normal shape, size and color and resume spore production. And it's really important just to note, it's a big disclaimer, um, not to eat any fungus from this group unless it's labeled as edible. Like really, you know, do your research and make sure because you don't want to, you know, get poisoning. And um, the best time to find these uh, fungus is in the fall or in the spring on logs, stumps, twigs, um, but they're also quite small, so you have to look quite carefully. And over here, I have one of my favorite ones from this class is the ear fungus. I just think it looks really so similar to an ear, it's freaky. <laughs> um, so they can be cup shaped or to ear shaped. They're rubbery. So if you touch them, they feel very interesting. Um, and they actually have a raised vein like markings on the inside as well, um, inside of the ear. And outside is slightly hairy, but the inside is smooth. So it's very like spookily similar to an ear. Um, and they're quite common and can be found on dead branches or logs. And you can also eat them as well. Um, you can go on to the next slide. So next we have coral fungi. So the fruiting bodies of this fungi actually grow upward, either as simple stalks or branching like coral growths. They are quite an attractive group of mushrooms, um, but they're very hard to identify because there's so many different types of them that all look very similar. And the best way to distinguish them is actually on a microscopic level. Um, this one here, we have Ramosopris kanzai. It's edible and it has slender branches, curves, and of uniform width. And it's actually easily identified and fruits in the ground in grassy places and in the woods. So it's very pretty, it kind of looks like undersea on the ground type of fungi. Uh, you can go on to the next one. So this one is tooth fungi, this is an example. Um, the spores of this fungi group are produced on the spore mother cells that form a layer on the outside of tooth-like spines. And these spines develop on the underside of the mushroom-like caps. And they're mostly inedible, but they have a widespread distribution across the country. Um, but they're way, way more common out on the East Coast um, than around, they are around here in Ontario, around the Great Lakes, but still possible to find them. This one here, I think is really interesting because it looks, <laughs> it's actually called bleeding tooth fungus. It exudes red droplets when young um, and the teeth, so the bottom of the fungus are salmon pink and they age between, and when they age, they turn brown and the flesh becomes kind of brown as well. And they have uh, a peppery taste and they fruit on the ground underneath um, con uh, conifer trees. So that's a very uh, funky looking fungi. <laughs> Uh, you can go on to the next slide. So this is a gill fungi. This is the largest group of macro fungi, also known as um, agartics, and are often identified by the different color spore prints and, of course, having um, gills underneath the caps. So. Once that are, was established, there are a number of other features associated with the fruit bodies that are used in aids 
um, for identifying these types of fungi, such as the color of the cap, the texture. And it's really important to note when identifying gill fungi that a young fruiting body may look way, way different than the mature fruiting body. Um, so I'll show a few examples of a mushroom from each color type spores uh, now. You can go on to the next slide. So pink spore mushrooms. So an example of one is called a horn of plenty. This one is edible. And although it is thin flesh, they are considered to be of quite excellent quality, used in a lot of um, higher class restaurants. And they are really widespread and they fruit on the ground in the woods. Go on to the next one. And then we have darker spurred mushrooms. Uh, we have sidewalk mushrooms. Um, so these ones can be like the name sounds on the side of the road. Um, the flesh of the mushroom is white, not staining. Uh, the socks are short and stout, wide and smooth, and also white. They look very similar to portobellos. Um, and they are widespread, common, and edible, but they really favor really hard packed soil. And on the left, we have the shaggy manes, which are, if you're into mushrooms, you know this is like a kind of a a gold trophy for most uh, foragers because they're really tasty. Um, they're covered with uh, brown or blackish uh, recurved scales and they usually fruit in grass and are associated with more disturbed sites. And they're edible and also very, very tasty, like I said. Um, you go on to the next slide now. So now we have brown spored mushrooms. So on the left, we have golden uh, philota. So the gills are attached and they're broad, they're close and yellow and becoming a little rusty as they get older. Um, they're very, very common. They fruit on dead wood and they're edible, but I don't recommend eating them because they taste kind of bad. Um, and on the right, we have, it's really pretty, it's called purple quart. Um, it has a really distinct color and it can range from deep violet to purplish black to, to blue gray. And they're very, very common and they fruit usually under coniferous trees. Um, and they're also edible, but of the same court family, there's also really deadly ones called the deadly court, the red gilled, cinnamon and blood red versions of the same type of mushrooms. So, but at least the colors are distinct so you know which one won't kill you. Um, and go on to the next slide. And then light spore mushrooms. So this is my favorite genius of this group, um, which has quite a lot of um, subcategories in the Amanitas. So, and so the first one I'll talk about is the Amanita. So the Amanita is probably the most common visual mushroom that most people have seen. Um, they're very, very beautiful mushrooms, very handsome, very stylish. <laughs> and they're also very ecologically important. Um, many are edible and very yummy, but they also are quite deadly. Um, the classic features of this fungus is that they have a white spore print. They have free gills, so that means the gills to the bottom of the fungus are not attached to the stalk. Um, they have a cup kind of like at the base of the stem, and they have really, really great ecological significance in forests. Um, they're suppliers of nutrients to both coniferous and harvard trees. And as on the left, you can see the beautiful fly, um, a gray egg mushroom, which also has hallucinogenic compounds of um, muscimol and ibotonic acid. And it is believed by some to be deeply involved in uh, prehistoric rituals and the origins of some religion. So. If you're, if you're excited to go down the rabbit hole of uh, the fly mushroom, um, it's quite an interesting rabbit hole to go down. And I recommend people uh, looking into that because it's really interesting. Um, and on the right, we have the false death cap. So they have stalks up to 12 centimeters tall, um, wide and white and smooth or lightly cottony towards the base. Um, they fruit on the ground in the woods. The pale ones are really easily recognizable, but the deeper cishan yellow ones can be confused with a death cap, and, but they're both like very poisonous, so don't eat them. And you go on to the next slide. So I'm just gonna do some honorable mentions of the genius of the light spore and mushrooms. Um, we have the Lepiota mushrooms. They have a white spore print and the gills are not attached to the stalk. Um, 
And the outer layer of the cap breaks up into scales as the cap expands. So my favorite ones of this is the honey mushrooms. They're so tasty and they're really easily recognizable by the color. They have a scaly cap and a flary ring. They're very, very widespread. Um, across Ontario. I remember foraging and found so many. And they're also bioluminescent. So they glow at night to attract um, the flies and things to spread their spores. And they also fruit in clusters on wood stumps in the late fall. Um, and you can go on to the next slide. And then we have the pluritory mushrooms, which are also uh, light spored. And um, most of you are probably familiar with them. We have the oyster mushroom, which um, fruits on dead logs or stumps and sometimes standing trees. They're so yummy. I love oyster mushrooms. They're probably one of my favorite things to cook. Um, and on the right, we have the angel wings, which are very beautiful. Um, the stalks are actually absent. They're widespread and they fruit on conifer trees. Um, similar to oyster mushrooms, they're very, very thin and also edible. And you can go on to the next slide now. So um, I just want to talk a bit about how to make your own spore prints. So now that we know all the different colors of spores and just kind of went, went through a couple types of mushrooms, um, of course, disclaimer, please just do your own research before you consume anything since Mushrooms can play tricks on us and something that looks edible is actually not edible. Um, and they are obviously just as complex and diverse as humans. Um, I love to make a spark print as part of my field journal, um, some art, and the process is really, really simple and really, really fun. So I recommend just getting like a foraging knife and just make sure when you're cutting the stem of the mushroom, cut as close to the top of the mushroom as you can and put a drop of water on top of the cap and then cover the cap with a jar, with a cup or whatever you have and wait about two to 24 hours, depending on the humidity and the freshness of the mushrooms. The spores will then fall off and then you'll have a beautiful spore print to keep. Um, so it's really good for actually identifying the mushrooms. You wanna see if it's light spore, if it's pink, if it's brown and you can truly uh, know exactly what it is. And it just makes for a cool uh, little project to have. <laughs> and you can go on to the next slide. So I just wanna give some foraging tips. Um, so there's so much, so many species out there. And um, this presentation just covers a very minuscule amount. And I would say that the most important thing to know on foraging for mushrooms is know your trees. Um, most mushrooms like a specific type of tree. And once you find the tree, the mushroom will probably be there. Um, you wanna look up, you wanna look down, you wanna look under things, over, anywhere, mushrooms will probably be there. And also once you find one type of mushroom, there's probably more around that area. So when you're looking for them, make sure you look around probably like, I would say a meter or, or less, and then you can see all the other types of mushrooms there. Um, and I say the ideal temperature or environment to go out looking for mushrooms is definitely after like a rainy day or if you can find like a foggy day. And when the temperature is a little bit warmer or humid, since water spreads the spores and when it's a foggy misty day, it's just, you know, the mushrooms are very happy and they're popping out everywhere. <laughs> And as well, when you're foraging to mushrooms, make sure you cut the mushrooms at the stem. Do not pull them out of the ground because when you pull them out of the ground, you interrupt the mycelium network and actually cannot grow back. So just you know, cut the top and just take what you need. Don't take any more than you're not going to consume. And honestly, just taking pictures is nice. You know, they look pretty. Take a picture and then leave it alone. <laughs> is what I say. Um, as well, um, just. You know, living in Ontario, ticks are quite common. And when foraging for mushrooms, you may be like, you know, crawling over things or stepping over some dead hardwood and stuff like that. So just make sure you're aware of the ticks and you're aware of like poisonous plants, like poison ivy and things like that, that can also be found in the same environment as mushrooms. Um, and overall, just have fun, make it an adventure. I think mushrooms are really uh, fun to forage with the whole family or with yourself um, really shows and exposes a whole new world that's just like you know in our backyards and mushrooms literally go everywhere so there's nowhere you can go where you're not going to find a mushroom 
Um, you can start a field journal or you can simply just take a bunch of pictures and see what makes you happy and look deeper into them. But yeah, so maybe even by foraging, you can find your own type of mushroom and eat them or, you know, maybe win a prize for finding your own mushroom. <laughs> um, and you can go on to the next slide now. Um, so these, these are my babies, I'm proud. <laughs> so this is my my Forge Hall of Fame. <laughs> so these mushrooms are the ones that I found last summer. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm showing off my children right now. So I'll just start from the left. Uh, we have the puffball mushrooms, the smaller ones. And as you can see, they're, they cover you know, the entirety of that area. And I don't know, the quality of the pictures kind of went down a little bit, but you can see the little holes and that's like the spores kind of like exploding out of it. Um, in the second panel here, I have um, turkey tail. So turkey tail is really beautiful and quite common and a very powerful medicinal mushroom. Um, I'm not gonna get into the medicinal mushrooms for today because that will take another hour, <laughs> but turkey tail is wonderful. And I think everyone should look into that and supplement that into your diet as well. I think taking tinctures of turkey tail is really, really beneficial for your gut health and for your brain. Um, and on the third panel, we have the glorious chicken of the woods. Um, a lot of people know about this mushroom because it tastes so good. Um, at the top is when I first found it in this like very fresh food and body stage. As, as you can see, it looks kind of like cartoonish a little bit. Um, and when you like rip a piece off, piece off of it, it actually has the texture of chicken. Um, and then the second is kind of when it's been, you know, spored out. I was getting ready to, you know, shrivel up again. But yeah, chicken in the woods is really tasty. They're quite distinct, so you can't really miss it. Um, and yeah, I hope everyone can try that one day. <laughs> um, at the top here, uh, we have an oyster mushroom that I just found on the log. So they grow very, like, plentiful in um, old growth forests, if you can find them. And at the bottom, underneath that, there is a bear tooth fungus. So bear tooth and lion's mane, a lot of people have heard of lion's mane, which is a really good uh, fungus for your brain. Um, but bear tooth has similar properties, but the it just has very small uh, gills coming out of it over the really long ones that the lion's mane has. And then the next one, we have a maize fungi. You can't really see the pictures because the quality went down, but it looks very, 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 very cool. It has the most distinct spore pattern that I've ever seen. It's quite beautiful. And yeah, everyone should like look into mace fungi because it's awesome. And above that, I have a nice inky cap um, right there with like the black and the white in the middle. Um, the inky cap is <laughs> um, really cool because the spores actually spread through the ink ink around it and you can actually draw with it um, and yeah they're really beautiful and they have this really nice iridescent look and the one at the top is the um, Ishnoderna uh, resinoum so this one also known as like steak of the woods people say you can cook it to taste like steak it's also uh, really really great for the environment because it actually takes away all the uh, polyester and those type of like clothing um, chemicals in the water and it actually absorbs it and like helps clean our waters so it's a quite a powerful one in combating that type of environmental impact that we have on on the on the earth but yeah so this is my little presentation on fungi i hope you all enjoyed it uh, i just want to open up the floor for any questions or any comments um yeah i think it's important to have discussion and learn from each other as well so if you have any questions you can unmute yourself and yes I got a question. Yeah. Um, uh, are there any local forays that you know about in the Toronto area? Um, I, think, I think honestly anywhere that is a little bit outside the city, um, you'll be good just because especially if you're foraging to consume, you want to make sure that you don't get any of the city air in your mushrooms. <laughs> um, but I would say High Park, I found a, a quite a bit there. Um, up near the Don Valley, it's just like there's so many, <laughs> and the Humber River as well, and yeah, more north, 
That's a lot. Just as long as you can get out of that downtown core, you'll be good. And um, my parents live in Burlington, so I would do a lot of foraging up in Hamilton, the escarpment. Um, and if you go up north, north, like all the way up to like uh, like uh, Sudbury in that area, Algonquin, there's just there's so many there. It's like absolutely beautiful. Thanks. No worries. Um, Otis? Out of all the mushrooms, which one's your favorite? Ooh, ooh, no, not this question. <laughs> um, so the classic who's your favorite child? <laughs> I like, hmm, I have to say I like the fly, the fly uh, great egg mushrooms, the red ones with like the white on it that looks like the toadstool. Those are my favorite, they're so beautiful. <laughs> What's your favorite mushroom, Otis? Do you have a favorite one? Turkey tail. Turkey tail, yay! Turkey tail is so yummy. Have you eaten them yet? No. No? Okay, cool. <laughs> um, any other questions? I'll check the chat. So over foraging mushrooms, I would say just, yeah, just take what you need really. If you see a patch and there's only like four or five, maybe just take one. But if you see a patch and there's like, you know, 300, just, you know, take as much <laughs> as you need. Um, as well, you spread the spores by just cutting the top off. So you're actually just adding to the cycle of life. So you're not really killing anything. It's just spreading more. Uh, to prepare the mushrooms, depends on the mushroom because mushrooms do take a lot of water and you really need to make sure you clean them properly because you know but maggots and like you know little ants like to get up all in there so you have to make sure you clean them really well by you can soak them for a bit um, make sure you can squeeze them and get all the water out and then make sure you set them in like a frying pan for a little bit and you'll see a lot of you know, steam coming out of it that's just the water evaporating uh, so you want to make sure that's all done first and add all your other vegetables and all of that um, at the farm, we're not growing mushrooms yet, but hopefully starting soon we'll grow mushrooms. And growing tips, uh, I just recommend sourcing your cultures from a really reputable place. Um, and yeah, just having fun with it. Like growing is definitely a journey and there's mistakes to be made and as well mushrooms People have cultivated mushrooms growing on the most random things ever. So <laughs> there's, there's no blueprint. <laughs> um, I have an insight on Indian pipe, if anyone else has insight on that. We'll send out the recording to everybody. Um, iNaturalist is really good for identification. Um, and of course, Google. <laughs> Google's really good and uh, Facebook groups. I found, I learned a lot from Facebook groups. I learned a lot from Reddit. There's a lot of good Reddit threads if you're into Reddit, um, but yeah. And also just by joining forums, you can post to Mushroom and ask people's opinions. Um, sometimes there'll be some debate, but <laughs> uh, just always trust, the, trust your gut. If you feel like you shouldn't eat it, then don't eat it. <laughs> Um, you can't really use the spores to grow at home. Um, if you want to use the spores, it's more of a technical process. You'll have to, you know, get some equipment to make sure it's all sanitary because the spores are so microscopic. They also invite other bacteria. So you want to make sure that you're making, uh, recommending books. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm using my books as a stand. <laughs> One second. So... Mycelium Running by Paul Stamets is my favorite. Um, Paul Stamets is a, is a great guy, knows so much about mushrooms. That's a really good one. If you're into cultivating, growing gourmet and medicinal mushrooms by Paul Stamets as well, it's also really good. Um, and I just recommend getting field guides from where, whatever, you're, oops, whatever country you're interested in. So if you want, let's say you're traveling in Mexico and you wanna know about Mexican mushrooms, you can, by like a, maybe a Mexican field guide to the mushrooms in the area. I know Ontario has one. Yeah, so everywhere has their own type of field guide, which is really good. Um, Hamilton, anywhere near the waterfalls is really good for foraging for mushrooms. Um, I found some near, what was it? I think Tulis Falls. 
things like that. Um, just really high up on the escarpment. I'm forgetting kind of closer to Ancaster is where I found like most mushrooms up in the Hamilton area. Yeah, entangled life. Yes. <laughs> um, So I've honestly heard really good things from people sourcing their mushrooms um, grow kits from Etsy. Um, so I think they're really, they're more self-made and you can really connect to the actual, the growers that are creating the, the grow kits. Um, oh, morels, good old morels. Um, morels are, can be tricky sometimes. Uh, I would say look for elm trees. They're usually around elm trees and look between, I think, maybe like a meter or less away from the elm tree. And they're usually kind of buried underneath the leaves. And yeah, but be careful with morels because there's something called a false, false morel that's poisonous. So just make sure if you cut your morel in half, it should be um, hollow in the inside. It sh there shouldn't be any, anything going on in there. <laughs> nice. Oh, cool. I got to go see if I can get some morels. Uh, does anyone else have any questions or comments? You can unmute yourself or you can um, just, yeah, say whatever you like. Oh, alleys? There's some morels in the alleys? I got to get out there. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm still learning. There's so much to learn. And I'm just really grateful to share what I've, what I've learned so far <laughs> and also willing to learn from everyone else. Hopefully once we can uh, get out there again, we can have a little Black Creek foraging trip for mushrooms. <laughs> awesome. Does anyone want to share their favorite mushroom? <laughs> or coolest mushroom that they've ever foraged? Turkey tail, yes, chaga, yes. Oh my, I forgot to talk about chaga, I can't believe it. <laughs> chaga is amazing. Chanterelles, oh, chanterelles are so tasty. Yeah, it's almost that season where they're gonna be everywhere again. So I'm very excited. Um, I would try uh, starter kits from Etsy, do Etsy Canada, and you can probably get a local um, starter kit. Ooh, cinnamon cups, honeys. Yeah, honeys are so tasty. Scurfy Deceiver. I've heard of that one. Yeah, mushrooms have such fun names. I love them. <laughs> They're quite like obvious names. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I've always wondered about the allergy for mushrooms since there's so many different types of mushrooms that we don't even know yet how people build allergies to, to them. It's quite interesting. <laughs> um, anyone else have any questions or concerns or anything at all? You can just talk about mushrooms. <laughs> um, I got interested in mushrooms because, um, yeah, I don't know. I've always been, they've always been like in the back of my head. And I guess when I was living in Australia and I was living in the rainforest there, I was just surrounded by mushrooms all the time. And I was like, what is this? Like, what is this? <laughs> and then eventually, like when I came back, I was like, I got to learn more about this. Like fungi is such a big, 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 you know, genius of things and just the benefits of the environment, the benefits of people. Like there's just so much packed into this that um, I really think they're the future. Like I definitely think fungi, mushrooms are the future of this world. And I'm really happy more attention is being brought into them because I think they can save the planet and the people as well. So hopefully we get to see more and more research put into it and yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, that's so cool.
Also, a big thank you for everyone for coming out again tonight. It's really happy to know, uh, see you, Greg, <laughs> that everybody is really into mushrooms. It makes me very happy because I feel like all I think about are mushrooms. <laughs> very much same. <laughs> yeah. Especially when foraging season starts, I'm like, oh my gosh, what can I find today? <laughs> And yeah, anybody can forage. Just go out there and look at the ground, look up the commune trees, look anywhere. Um, yeah, you don't you don't need anything. You just need yourself and your eyes. And you don't even need your eyes. You can just go and feel your way through things. <laughs> and the weather's getting warmer. And yeah, it's all good things. It's gonna be a good, good summer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so any guild fungi will be really good for spore prints because you can get to the, since the bottom's guilds, when you drop the water on, it'll spread really nicely. Like things like the, you know, the ear fungi, they don't really have that uh, as part of their makeup because they're just very gelatinous. They feel quite weird. <laughs> I hope someone can find one and uh, feel them because they're very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, if you make any spore print art, uh, feel free to email me with it. I would love to see it. Um, or if you just make a cool spore print and want to share it, send it my way. <laughs> Adriel, can you um, say again how you did that spore print? I, I kind of caught it first time around. It sounded like you put the mushroom cap um, and then you put some water on top and then covered it with a glass. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. And, that, and that's just to generate some humidity in there, which releases the spores. Yeah, exactly. Okay, just cool. Of, then I did get it. <laughs> you got it exactly. It's very, very simple. It's just, it's just basically mimicking the environment at the outside as if it just rained. Um, so those spores that end up in the paper were actually spores that just spread um, all around the forest. And the images that, sorry, I should show my video. Sorry. It's, no, don't worry. <laughs> it's rude not to talk. <laughs> um, um, when you did that, it looked like you had done some different colored papers. Like, do you use a specific kind of paper? Like, or is it just whatever you have on hand? You can use any paper you want, really. You can use tinfoil as well, if you want to actually like, preserve them to make um, kind of uh, like liquid culture and stuff to like grow them again. But yeah, you can use paper if you want it to like stay on it, but tinfoil is the one you can use to add it into like liquid culture or like agar to grow the mushroom. That's so cool. Anything at all, really. You can even use your hands, but like I don't recommend it because it'll yeah. go into your skin. But <laughs> um, yeah, the spores are pretty harmless. Um, they only really harm, like inhaling the spores is only a problem if you're in a room that mushrooms are all growing in because that means there's spores everywhere and you're just going to consume that all, but it'll be good. <laughs> so that was another question that I had too was um, for the mushrooms that are um, toxic when ingested. Mm -hmm. um, what if you touch them? Like if you get it on your, I mean, not that you're going to necessarily get it on your hands and then lick your fingers, but um, mm -hmm. can, can you have a skin reaction to it too? In, or, or is it just solely from ingesting? Um, most of the time it's solely from ingesting, but I would say if you're touching it um, and then you may like, I don't know, maybe touch your face or things like that, you may have a, a reaction depending on your body. So there's not a lot of research done into mushrooms enough to know like what mushrooms create what. So sometimes people are like, oh, like I'm allergic to this. I didn't even know. So yeah, it's just, if it's poisonous, I just, I wouldn't touch it, but um, just Look be with your eyes, not with your hands. <laughs> yeah, and okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for asking. <laughs> My top three mushrooms are the fly mushroom, turkey tail, and the Ishnoderma resonatum. They're very, very pretty. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Color papers are good because the white spores don't show up. Yeah. What are your favorite mushrooms, Ajiba? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> So I would definitely say chicken of the woods. I'm like obsessed with that thing. I feel like it's one of the only mushrooms I like very much trust my identification on. So I'm like, I love you. Um, <laughs> I really, um, 
So other than Chicken of the Woods, there's also Hen of the Woods that I really love because it looks very like gentle and light. And I think it looks really pretty. And then, yeah, I have to be with you on the fly, Agaric. I I feel like that's like the mushroom, like very much in cartoons, like the, the, whenever they show a mushroom, they show that one. So it reminds me of like childhood cartoons and just like the whimsy of mushrooms. So I really love that one as well. <laughs> There's like a whole, so much mythology associated with that mushroom. Exactly, um, exactly. The of Santa Claus. No, it has to do with that mushroom. And yeah, yeah. Very deep rabbit hole that um, I find very entertaining. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so next week we will talk about lichen, I think. I think it's lichen next week. <laughs> or it might be slime molds. Uh, so yeah, next week we'll talk about lichen, which I love as well. Um, and the week after, we'll talk about slime molds, and which is also very funky. Um, and then maybe next month we'll do some, you know, mushroom talk of, uh, you know, weird, really weird mushrooms or how to cultivate mushrooms. And um, yeah, thank you for coming. Thank you, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you for all the questions. And I hope everybody, please, please just send me pictures of your mushrooms. I, I really like to see pictures of mushrooms. <laughs> So flood my inbox with mushroom pictures because I would love to see them. <laughs> and of course, if you have any foraging questions as well, just send me an email. Thank you for coming, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. You, Brian. <laughs>